Today's uh, the last lecture in my part of the course and one of the challenges with um, undergraduate courses is the students are always very focused on exams. Oh, tell me all the exam problems because I have to get do well in the exam so I can maximise my WAM. Um, and when you're teaching it, you realise that the obsession with exam questions is actually kind of dangerous because you're always working with problems that have very obvious pathway to solution. Um, they're able to be done in a relatively short period of time and most of the problems that you deal with in the real world are not actually anything like exam problems. They're a bit messier, they lot, take a lot longer, you have to make some compromises in the way you approach the problem. So whereas most of my previous lectures um, in this course have been very much um, tipped towards um, either exam questions or relatively easy assignment problems. Today I want to get into some problems that are actually kind of on that edge of real world hard a little bit, okay? And so as a part of that, I'm going to go a little faster with maths because I haven't got time to stop on every little bit. And so I'm going to leave a few little nuggets off as exercises just to confirm for yourself rather than going through every single step in the problem so I can focus on the bits that are kind of complicated, okay? All right, so let's get into it. We're going to start today with Euler's equations, and essentially what we're dealing with here is taking the equations of motion that we would have in linear motion, which we can call Newton's equations, coming around from um, Newton's laws, and we're building a set of, a, of rotational equivalents, and we call these Euler equations, right? And we're going to apply them to two, normally to two types of situations. One type of situation is that we have a body that is um, being rotated or pivoted about a fixed point. So it could be something as simple as rotating on um, an axis like this. You can see I'm going to have some fun with my green screen today. Um, recording in the afternoon for once. Um, rotating about um, some fixed point, and here this is a whole fixed axis, but you remember in the last lecture we actually dealt with precession, and so what we had was uh, our object tipping and spinning and then rotating around in a precessional motion, and there's only one fixed point now, and that fixed point is basically this origin at the bottom, okay? So we've got a fixed, pivoting about a fixed point, that's one. The other one that we can have in here is a body that's... Um, doesn't have a fixed point at all. So we've talked about this example earlier. It's rotating on its axis and it's ro moving as a center of mass motion about some point of rotation, okay? And you know in this case too, what we can do is separate the center of mass motion from the rotation about the center of mass and just deal with the rotation about the center of mass as its own problem. And that kind of reduces us from problem two back to problem one, okay? So just to pick up where we are. What we're going to do today is build in some of the earlier stuff from rotational reference frames as well. So we're going to have an inertial reference frame. You can imagine it's the room I'm sitting in. And what I'm going to do is set up a set of axes X, Y, Z um, that makes sense in that space. And to give it a proper name so we don't have to deal with S and S naught, I'm going to call it the space frame, right? It's the space that I'm in. And then I can take my object and um, I might go to something that shows a bit better for most of this in the... Um, in the green screen, um, I can attach a set of axes to that too. And you'll know from yesterday's lecture that the ideal axes to choose for this are the, thing, are the ones we call the principal axes. Okay? They're mutually orthogonal. Um, they often run along a symmetry um, if you have a symmetry in that system. And you normally call them e, E1, E2, E3. And often you choose E3 to be one of your preferential directions. It's usually the one where you've always got a rotation in the, in the, in the problem. Okay? And now we're going to have those as separate coordinate systems. So we're going to have a space frame, which is an inertial reference frame X, Y, Z. And we're going to have a co-rotating body frame. So the frame is going to rotate with the object um, that's going to be made up of the principal axis, E1, E2, E3. Um, and we're going to set this up so that the origin of my space frame coincides with the origin of my rotating frame. Um, so that, you know, for example, if I'm measuring distances from the origin in both of those frames, the distances at least are equal between the two systems. Okay, so this is, this is pretty much just a recap on where we've been and where we want to start out today. So if we think about a system like this and start trying to build up um, some mathematics around it, we've got um, uh, angular velocity omega, right? So imagine we've got some something that's sort of spinning on an axis, right? Um, and we've got um, 
our motion moments of inertia and because we're choosing principal axes they're principal moments so they're the diagonal elements in the inertia tensor when it's been diagonalized right and so this will give us um, a angular momentum vector um, here that is um, lambda 1 omega 1 lambda 2 omega 2 um, lambda 3 omega 3 like so okay um, and let me just clean up this line above for a second so this would be um, omega 1 omega 2 omega 3 just general rotation and lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda 3 as our principal moments um, happening up there okay now, one thing we know is that if there's a torque on the body in the, as, as seen in the space frame, and we dealt with this when we um, did our problem um, in the last lecture of a um, processing um, top, um, what we had was we looked at that from the space frame and this object wants to fall over, so there's a force which exerts a torque and a torque changes the angular momentum, okay? So, what we can start to write here is something that looks like a rotational equivalent of Newton's second law. And very specifically, it is um, dL on dt um, in our space frame is equal to tau. Okay, so just relating torque to the time derivative of angular momentum, which is the same as revo um, referring force to the change in time with momentum. And you'll remember that we can also take this expression we had a couple of lectures ago where we take an arbitrary vector um, and its time derivative from one reference frame and transfer it to, say, from an inertial frame to a rotating frame, right? Um, we had this like d on d, uh, dq on dt equals dq on dt um, plus omega cross q. And earlier on we showed we could do that for position, but you can do that for angular momentum as well. So um, what we can write here is dL on dt, um, body frame. Um, and of course, it's now our rot that's our rotating frame. And we'll have omega cross L in here. Um, L, is, is, L is a vector I'm running through. And you'll notice I've used little omega here. And I can use little omega here because I've got a co-rotating reference frame, right? As long as my reference frame is rotating at the same angular velocity as the object, there's no point having a big omega. I can just make it little omega, all right? Okay, so one way to write this would just be L dot plus omega cross L, like so, okay? Um, and then the last step in this is actually just to pull um, the various pieces um, together in here. So what we can write is something that looks like this. L dot plus omega cross L is equal to tau. Okay. And so um, you can see, sure enough, we get an equation that looks like this. It's a thing that we call Euler's equation. And it's worth having a name for it because, in a sense, it's kind of a corrected version of um, Newton's um, equation um, F equals dP on dt, but now corrected for the fact that we have to deal with rotation of our reference frame. Okay. Um, it's pretty rare that you actually use this equation in its own form. And so what you often use is what we call Euler's equations, which are then the individual components of um, that equation. Okay, And we can get these um, pretty straightforwardly. I'll go partway down this and then let you finish it off. So we'd have d on dt here of lambda 1, omega 1, lambda 2, omega 2, and lambda 3, 3 omega 3 plus our cross product will now be a nice big determinant um, and as I mentioned earlier the smart way to do this is to write your widest terms first so you can set the width of it um, lambda 3 omega 3 um, so this will be now omega 1 omega 2 omega 3 j k just in here and then, of course, this thing's going to be equal to uh, our vector components of, of tau. So this would be tau 1, tau 2, and tau 3 in here. Right. And so then what we would do here is basically break this thing down into, into little pieces, right? So we would have like a lambda 1, omega 1 dot in the i direction, plus 
another two derivative terms that would come after it, right? There'd be a lambda 2 omega 2, a lambda 3 omega 3, one's a long j, one's a long k. Then I would also work through here and get my components from my cross product, right? And so you will have in here terms that look a little bit like um, lambda 3 omega 3 omega 2 minus lambda 2 omega 3 omega 2 um, that's a 3 just there um, i and you'd have j and k for those as well and then that's going to be equal to tau 1 i plus um, the various components and so what you do is you break this up into an I section a J section and a K section because any vector you can decompose it into its three components and If you take a look at this little piece in here, you'll notice there's a common factor omega 3 omega 2 So you here you would have lambda 3 minus lambda 2 omega 3 omega 2 in here Okay, so if we pull these together as three separate equations and I'll let you just walk through the steps because it's a nice little piece of um, linear algebra practice. What you'll get is a set of equations that all look like this. You've got a lambda one, omega one, um, so you've you've got a, a contribution to this in the in the in the i direction. Then you've got con contributions from your other two directions coming from the cross product um, that then refer to that torque in that i direction. Okay. So we've got mixed terms in here, and those mixed terms actually are what makes Euler's equations interesting because they can give you some rather interesting effects, right? If all we had was direction 1 was connected to direction 1, um, direction 2 to 2, and 3 to 3, then we would get something very similar to um, linear motion where you don't really get a lot of a surprising in, um, dynamical effects turning up. This cross product up in here is actually kind of one of the fun parts of rotational motion. Okay. So you have these things, Euler's equations, and often the problems you deal with these are rather difficult because, as you can tell, there's a lot of variables, there's a lot of directions, and the problems get hard very, very fast. Okay? Often we take simplifying cases, and one we will take a bit later in the lecture um, is to make torque equal to zero, um, which then enables you to take this second component and pop it out on the end so you can equate your sort of principal direction to your other two directions. Um, and you can take simplifying cases like making lambda 1 and lambda 2 equal, okay? So if you make lambda 1, lambda 2 equal here, this term goes to zero. If you make the torque um, equal to zero, that term goes away. And you have a really simple equation in here of just, you know, um, the time dependence of the angular momentum is zero, so the angular momentum is constant. Okay, really simple. So a lot of these cases you take these and you simplify them. Where I want to go today is actually to look at some sort of interesting, more tricky things. And if you happen to have um, a space station, you can do a nice little experiment that looks like this. What you're seeing here is something known as the Zanibakov effect. Uh, it's named after a Russian astronaut who first um, demonstrated it in, in this way. And what's going on there is you've got a rotating object and it's clearly undergoing this very interesting unstable rotation. It rotates okay for a while and then flips over, rotates okay for a while, flips over, and, and keeps doing this again and again and again, okay? Um, nice effect and one of the really fun things to do in physics is actually to see effect and then try and build a theory for where this comes from, okay? So let's, let's do that um, in this particular case, okay? So what we've got is zero torque. If you remember back to that video, there's an initial thing where you kick it just to make it spin and then you leave it. And once it comes out of the screw thread, then it, it keeps going. And of course, you're in zero gravity environment. So assuming that nothing's touching it, it's not charged, there's no gravity, whatever, there's no torques, there's no forces applied to that object. So we can start out this problem with zero torque. The other thing that is interesting is that in order to get that effect to happen, you need an object where all three of the principal momenta are different. And you need a very specific relationship between the sets of principal um, uh, m moments to come about in order to get it, okay? And you'll see where that comes up in the maths, all right? So um, as my proxy object here, I'm gonna use a corkscrew. I'm gonna define this direction here as my three axis, because it's the one I'm gonna have that very high speed um, 
rotation about. And then I've got two other axes in here that are perpendicular to that, right? One points this way and one points this way. And if you rotate about that one, you'll notice that that motion is a very different motion to this motion. Uh, sorry, hang on, let me think about this. Um, I've got that going that way. I've got one axis this way and I've got one axis this way. So if I rotate about the axis going this way, I've got this type of motion. And if I rotate about the axis going this way, I've got this type of motion, okay? And you'll notice that they're two very different types of motion. This one here has this whole part of the body going around. And then this one through um, this axis here actually has this long part stable, okay? So um, fairly complicated problem. Three different moments. We've got to be careful about which way they're going. And you notice that right at the start, it's very easy to trip yourself up on how to think about this. So you might want to go find a corkscrew while you go and slowly replay through this lecture and play around with it because it's actually kind of useful to um, take your time and work your way through this. Okay. So where we're going to start is that we have... Um, Omega 1 equals omega 2 equals 0, and omega 3 is not 0, okay, to start out. And if you think back to the video, that's exactly the case. You give this thing a twist, and of course it's being held rotating in a fixed axis by unscrewing from the point that it's in. And so the ability for it to rotate in a non-corkscrew direction um, is constrained by the fact that it has to screw out of that thread. Okay, so we can, in, in, in the beginning, set omega 1 and omega 2 to 0, and omega 3 is not 0. And so if we think back to our third of the Euler equations, what we would have is omega 3, uh, lambda 3 omega 3 dot is equal to uh, lambda 1 minus lambda 2 um, omega 1, omega 2, okay? Now, at the moment, lambda 1 and lambda 2 are not equal, so that term is not 0. But omega 1 and omega 2 are either 0 or very close to 0, and so this thing is roughly 0, which means that um, omega 3 dot is um, 0 and omega 3 is constant, okay? So as this thing's screwing out, it will just screw out at a constant speed, okay? Now what happens is when it gets to the end of the screw, like the very last bit of the screw thread, decoupling from that screw thread will give it a very tiny kick and mean that at least instantaneously omega 1 and omega 2 are no longer 0, okay? Um, and so now we're dealing with the case, once it leaves, of omega 1 is not equal to not omega 2 is not equal to 0, and we have to readjust our mathematics in this problem, okay? All right, so the first thing you'll notice is that um, omega 3 will very slightly begin to change, and if you watch through the video, you'll notice that it changes as a function of time. And I'm not actually going to solve that equation because it's not the interesting one, but if you want to do it as a side exercise, you can actually work your way through what happens with the omega 3 equation and show how that behaves as a function of time, okay? Neat little exercise for people who want to play around with something hard. What I'm going to do is go to the other two equations in here. And so what I have is lambda 1 omega 1 dot. Um, is equal to um, lambda 2 minus lambda 3 omega 3 omega 2. And you'll notice that I've split these two omegas for the moment. You'll see why when I write the second one down. So this is lambda 2 omega 2 dot is equal to um, lambda 3 minus lambda 1 um, omega 3 omega 1 on the end, okay? So the reason why I've put these square brackets in is because I want to cluster this omega 3 term that's common between the two into a constant in the front and then just keep the 2 and 1 terms um, floating around as variables on the end because I'm setting myself up a, a pair of DEs here, okay? And of course, these two terms in the brackets are going to be roughly constant. The reason why they're going to be roughly constant is that lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 1 are fixed. The body's not changing its shape. And at least for very high rotational velocity, 
um, omega-3 is not going to change very much, okay? So it's, a, it, it's what we're going to call in this problem sort of a quasi-constant, okay? Um, if we really wanted to solve this problem in its full detail, we would have to let omega-3 change, but then we get a set of equations that are sufficiently difficult that we can't really solve them very easily. So this is another one of these cases where sometimes you have to take a compromise in order to get a, a, a solvable problem. So let's call this 1, let's call this 2. Um, and to a very good approximation, omega-3 is roughly constant Okay, um, in this problem. And if you work it out, you'll find that it is. So what we can do to take this one more step in here is to take equation 1 and get the time derivative for it. Okay, And um, if we do that, what we're going to get is lambda 1 omega 1 double dot is equal to um, lambda 2 minus lambda 3 omega 3 um, omega 2 dot and some of you who you know take the, take the traditional position that you do when you come up through your high year courses of well let's do everything properly will notice that um, up here in, in this equation um, omega 2 and omega 1 are not zero a lambda 1 minus lambda 2 is not 0, so omega 3 can't be 0. And when we take the time derivative of this first equation here, we should be taking a second term on the end that's got an omega 3 dot, right? You would imagine that there would be um, a term in here, uh, lambda 2 minus lambda 3, um, omega 3 dot, omega 2. But what we're relying on in this problem is that omega-3 is very large. Omega-3 is not going to change very much because even though we've made omega-1 and omega-2 non-zero, we're keeping them small. And so this second term in that derivative is much smaller than the first one. So what we're actually going to do is ignore this second term in order to make the problem tractable, right? Because otherwise we end up in maths that's just so hard to solve we're never going to get there. If you really do care about the very specifics of the problem, you would go and solve that, but you might not be able to do it via analytical techniques. You might have to you know, spend a lot of time working on it. But often in physics, you can get acceptable solutions by making little compromises like this. And this is one of the nice things to learn as you come along through the subject. So let's call this equation three. And then we can substitute our equation 2 above into equation 3 now. And this will give us something that looks like this. Omega 1 double dot is equal to, so I'm going to pull the lambda 1 down in here implicitly, um, lambda 2 minus lambda 3 uh, omega 3 on um, lambda 1. So that's really just taking this part of the term. And then I need to substitute in my omega 2 dot. So what I've got up here is um, lambda 3 minus lambda 1 omega 3 on lambda 2. And I've got an omega 1 on the end that comes from my second equation. Okay, so now what I've done is instead of having um, omega 1 connected to omega 2 on the end, I've got omega 1 on the, connected to omega 1 on the end. Okay. And so this thing is um, minus um, lambda 3 minus lambda 2, lambda 3 minus lambda 1 on lambda 1, lambda 2, um, omega 3 Q, uh, squared, omega 1. Okay. And so where this minus sign out the front comes from is that I've reversed... Um, not that one, I reversed the other one. Um, I reversed the order of, of that bracket, okay? And I've done that for reasons that will become clear in, in a few moments from now, okay? And so this thing is really just a, a constant or what I would call a quasi-constant, right? Lambda 1, Lambda 2, Lambda 3 are fixed. Omega 3 is almost fixed. So if I pull this thing together, it's basically a constant, right? And so I can decide that it is and give it a name. So this is minus a omega 1 to decent approximation, right? Okay, and you can imagine right now thinking, well, can I do this with omega 2? Of course you can, right? So you can write a very similar looking equation for omega 2 as well. And as you'll see as we get through this problem, omega 1 and omega 2 are kind of coupled situations that you could solve out if you wanted to. There's two possible options that happen in here. Um, 
I'll call it option one so I don't confuse my A's. Um, option one is that A is a positive number. And if, if it is, then omega one double dot will be equal to, well actually let's just take away equals, it will, it will be proportional to minus omega one, okay? And this is just a DE, we've solved this DE a stack of times now. Um, it's omega one goes something like e to the minus i beta t. And I probably don't even care about the details in this because I've already got the most important observation out of this. Um, what I've got out of here is that this thing is an oscillatory term. Okay, so what's going to happen is that um, I'm going to have a, a, a rotation about omega three, and then my omega one is going to oscillate. Okay, so I'm going to have a, like an oscillation in that other direction um, that kind of gives me a wobble. The other thing that we know from up above, and if we flip the terms of the um, equation around up here, um, we can see it. We've got um, omega one dot related to omega two. We can see this the other way around. So omega two is gonna be related to omega one dot, right? Um, and we know if, um, omega one is oscillating, then that means that omega two is gonna be oscillating, right? If we take the time derivative of an oscillating function, we get another oscillating function. So omega two will oscillate as well. So we'll get a pair of oscillations coming out of this thing. Okay, um, we'll come back and talk about the, the behavior that arises from that in a moment. But first I wanna look, look at how you get A positive. There's two possible ways that this can happen. One is that lambda three is greater than, or well, it, let's take a quality away so that we can be very definitive. It's greater, and then I go and write greater than or equal to. It's it's greater than lambda one and lambda two, um, or lambda three is less than lambda one and lambda two. And I forgot to write the two up here. Let's make that a proper comma so people can read. Excellent. All right. Okay, so let's think about how this comes about for a second. If you look at this term up here, if lambda 3 is bigger than lambda 2, that bracket is positive. If lambda 3 is bigger than lambda 1, that bracket is positive. Positive times positive is positive, so A is positive, right? The alternative option is if lambda 3 is smaller than lambda 2, the first bracket's negative. If lambda 3 is smaller than lambda 1, the second bracket is negative. Negative times negative is positive, so it's positive, okay? So there are your two possible cases. Either the um, number three principal axis is the largest principal moment or it's the smallest principal moment in the problem, okay? And that just gives you um, an oscillation um, about your position. We also have option two in here and option two is that A is negative. And this corresponds to the case in here, omega double dot one is proportional to omega one. And of course, we know the solution to that DE as well, because we've kind of done it to death in, in our courses so far. It's omega one goes something like e to the beta t, right? It actually drives away exponentially. And we know same as above, that omega two is proportional to omega one dot. And of course, if you take the time derivative of an exponential, you get an exponential, right? So omega two is an exponential as well. So what we have here is two interesting types of motion. I'm gonna come back to my football to do it, even though it's got more symmetry than my corkscrew, because it just, the corkscrew messes with my head a bit. Um, if we rotate along our uh, lambda three axis here, right? Um, you'll notice that um, lambda three is this direction. Lambda one would be this direction. Lambda two would be this direction, right? So what we're now gonna get is a, a spinning object and then it's gonna oscillate in one direction and oscillate in the other direction. And so what it's gonna be doing is something that looks like this. It's gonna be spinning at the same time as it's sort of wobbling its way through the air, right? And that's an oscillatory term. 
The second option that we have in here is basically that once omega starts to change, it changes faster and faster and faster and faster, right? So your spinning object goes and it actually tumbles and flips over onto the other side, okay? So you can see that this one is actually the one that corresponds to the de Nibirkov effect because it drives around to the other side of this thing, okay? Now, it comes about in the case where A is negative and the way we can get A negative is um, two cases. One is that we got lambda 1 less than lambda 3 less than lambda 2 and the other is we've got lambda 2 less than lambda 3 less than lambda 1. Okay, so just pop back up and consider this for a second. If lambda 3 is bigger than lambda 2, that first bracket's positive. If lambda 3 is smaller than lambda 1, the second bracket's negative. Positive times negative is negative. Or the other way around, if um, lambda 3 is smaller than lambda 2, the first one is negative. If lambda 3 is then bigger than lambda 1, the second one's positive. Negative times positive is negative, so we get A negative, right? So this other behavior where um, omega drives exponentially is the case where the moment that it's spinning about is the intermediate of the two of the three principal moments. So there's one larger than it and there's one smaller than it, okay? And so if you think your way back to this corkscrew, you can see that that's definitely the case because the biggest moment is actually this fat um, handle on the end of your corkscrew. That's your biggest one. Then the um, um, other one here is intermediate and then the third one fits in in between, okay? So that's where you get that behavior from. Um, and someone earlier in the course asked me, oh, do we get any more complicated phase spaces than this? And um, at the time I said, oh, you know, let's wait, see, maybe some will pop up. And here's one that pops up. This is a really nice place to introduce one, okay? So here's probably the final phase space for my part of the course. But if you go on to do mechanics, you'll see more phase spaces. What we're now doing is plotting this as a 3D phase space of the motion, okay? And if you look at this, you'll notice that it has some it basically looks like the one that we had for a pendulum way back earlier in the course, just wrapped around the outside of a sphere, okay? So let's have a look at the um, end points or the, the, the key points in it. There's one here where you've got essentially a phase space circle around a fixed point, right? And if you remember a phase space circle around a fixed point back when we did oscillations, that was basically like the bottom of a pendulum. It's a stable equilibrium. And so what this is pointing to is um, pairs of stable equilibrium points. Two of them correspond to um, lambda 3 being the highest principal moment, and two of them correspond to lambda 3 being the lowest principal moment. Okay, And so, same as we had with our pendulum in that particular case, um, it sort of oscillates around um, a, 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 a small amount of non-equilibrium. Same thing happens um, for the rotational motion there, right? So we'd have a rotation, and then it will just do a sort of a wobble like this as it comes out, okay? And so what would have been really nice in that video actually is to have one that uh, doesn't have, um, or where the, the moment that you're rotating along this direction is the um, highest or the lowest moment and show that you don't get that tumbling that turns up um, in that corkscrew. And then these points here are unstable equilibrium points. And if you remember back to your pendulum, where you get these cross points is basically where the pendulum will be upwards, right? And so as soon as you give it a little tip, it's gonna run away really, really, really fast um, to, um, towards another equilibrium. But it can also do a behavior where it pops round and then comes back up onto the same point, right? And so you remember what we had was basically a cross point here, a cross point further over, and going from one to the other basically corresponds to your pendulum going all the way around and coming back to another unstable point. And now if you think about the Zanibov effect, you can see exactly what's going on here. You've got this rotating object. It comes out, it gets a little kick. Um, because the moment that it's rotating about is the intermediate moment, um, what it will do is it will exponentially run away from that and it will head all the way round to the opposing um, unstable equilibrium point where it then looks like it's spinning. And of course it's still keeping its way going round, so it will then flip round back onto the other 
unstable equilibrium point and it will just keep doing this and you see exactly what you see in the video okay I'll go back to the video again in a second but what's really happening here is you're just flipping from this unstable point on one side to the unstable point on the other back to the first one back to the second one back to the first one okay and so this is why phase spaces are kind of cool in mechanics because you can actually visualize the dynamics not just looking at the dynamics but how the parameters that you're interested in relate to the dynamics okay and to make this a little easier you might have a 3d diagram here you might take sections or you might take cuts through this thing and generate all sorts of nice diagrams that pop out okay so just one last look at it um, start it spinning as soon as it pops out of that screw hole there's an asymmetry that gives it a kick and you'll notice that it flips from pointing on one point on the other point on the one point on the other point on the one point on the other okay and this is really just moving between those two um, unstable equilibrium points on the opposite sides of the face space and you'll notice that it's maintaining omega 3 at those two endpoints right it's not slowing down its rotation significantly so our approximation that omega 3 is roughly constant is correct um, over a long enough time scale to do with what we're doing in this problem okay all right um I'm gonna leave that problem there and let it to you as an exercise to just play with the equations don't need to do it at this point in the course you can do it in your holidays you can do it in a couple of years you can do it sometime when you're bored but it's a fun thing this is actually a fun effect to keep playing with the equations mathematically and if you're really good at computation you can even build yourself up little models of it and stuff like that it's kind of nice what I'm going to do is do one last little problem before we take a break um, because we've got the mathematical apparatus set up that we need for it and the thing that I want to um, pick up in here is the case where lambda 1 is now equal to lambda 2 okay so now I can safely take my corkscrew and um, get rid of it I don't need it anymore and I'm going to come back to something that looks a little bit more like my um, invisible football or my lemon juice container okay um, so now we've got a, a symmetry here that means that lambda 1 is similar to lambda 2 okay so it's an axial symmetry about one axis and then one of the axes is different the long one okay um, so you can as just imagine this is a football um, but you can actually see it um, what we know is that if we go back up to um, this equation here now this term at the front will be zero so we end up in this nice case we talked right back in the earlier slide where um, lambda 3 omega 3 dot is equal to zero and so omega 3 is a constant okay and that in this case it really is a very very rigid constant okay and this points to something that's actually kind of nice um, you'll notice often when you have projectiles moving um, a way to stop them from doing uncontrolled rotations is to have them having very high speed controlled rotation okay um, and what you're relying on here is the axial symmetry to make lambda 1 equal to lambda 2 um, your uh, omega 3 then becomes constant and it also constrains your omega 1 and omega 2 quite tightly so if you happen to actually go and play American football when you throw over a long distance the thing you learn very quickly is that if you just throw the ball without spinning it it just sort of t wildly tumbles through the air catches the breeze and then the other person trying to chase it has to run all over the place to get it and if you watch the really good quarterbacks in the game um, and this is one of the skills is getting your fingers able to basically impart rotational momentum into the ball when you let it go um, the idea is that you've got a very high omega 3 that then stabilizes against rotations in the omega 2 and omega 3 directions uh, omega 1 and omega 2 directions and so your motion is is then a lot cleaner because one you're maintaining the lowest profile to your drag as you move through the air which is I guess a secondary effect because you can always just operate in a vacuum um, probably good for coronavirus actually to operate in a vacuum and uh, 
And that sort of stabilizes that object and keeps it from tumbling, which then makes the motion rather difficult. Okay. Another case where you see it um, with projectiles is bullets um, out of guns, right? So if you look at the inside of a barrel of a long range rifle, make sure it's unloaded when you do it. Um, if you have a good look inside, you'll notice that there's a set of helical grooves around the inside um, of the barrel. And the idea is, as the gas behind the bullet expands, it basically starts to spin as it runs up the grooves up the side. And that imparts a rotational momentum to the bullet as it travels up the barrel. Once it leaves, it continues spinning. And that stops it from tumbling through the air and... Um, going off in all sorts of funny directions. So again, you've got this idea of rotational stabilization of motion, okay? It's why a lot of things are made with axial symmetry when you're making projectiles. Um, if you're building satellites, you often do the same thing. Put an axial symmetry in there so that you can make sure that the thing is dynamically stable. Okay, we can take our other two Euler equations and rewrite them, right? Um, and I'm gonna do this fairly quickly and let you clean up the details later on. So this is lambda one minus lambda three, um, omega three on lambda one, uh, omega two. And this is omega two dot is equal to, I've got a minus sign in here because I've reversed the order of the bracket, right? Um, and I'm doing this deliberately because I want it to look the same as the term above. Um, omega three, omega one. Okay, and so you'll notice that uh, the first one is the same as um, it was higher up, except now what I've done is made my lambda 2 equal to lambda 1, so I've called it lambda 1, and then this first one I've just reversed the order and I've made those two things equal. Okay, so I'll let you work that out one, that one out for yourself later on, but it's, it's fairly, um, fairly easy to, to tie together. And I mean... The main reason I've called it lambda 1 is just convenience. I could call it lambda 2 if I wanted to all the way through, or I could even just call it lambda and just assign a new value that's equal to lambda 1, lambda 2. It doesn't really matter how you do it as long as you're careful with the maths. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this thing here into a constant. And now I know it's an, it's an even better constant than the problem I just had because lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 are fixed and omega 3 is even better fixed now in this problem because I've made lambda 1 equal to lambda 2. Okay, It's even more of a constant. So this thing is a constant. I'm going to call it omega b and I'm going to call it omega b because I know where I'm going with this. Okay, um, And so this would now be omega b, omega 2 and minus omega b, omega 1. Okay. You all spot where we are now. We're in another one of these situations where we have a pair of coupled ordinary differential equations and we've solved those a couple of times this course and this being the third time I've done it I'm going to do it super fast. So um, we assign a complex variable eta that is basically omega 1 plus i omega 2. Let me just note in here it's a coupled ODE. Um, and then we can recast our differential equation and now it looks like eta dot is equal to minus i omega b eta. Okay? I'm going to let you do this as an exercise. If you substitute eta into that equation and um, work through, you can decouple that back into your two um, DEs, okay? So this is a good way to check that you understood what happened earlier in the course when we solved this properly. The other case is that we know the solution. And the solution is that eta is equal to eta dot um, E minus I omega B T, okay? And I'll let you substitute that into the equation and check that that's the solution for yourself as well. Okay, I've done both of those things in my notes, um, so you can check that you've got that right. And of course, when we're solving a DE, we always care about um, initial conditions. And so what we do here is set our initial conditions so that um, omega 1 equals omega naught, omega 2 is 0 at t equals zero. And all I've, all I've done here is basically said, I've got my spinning object, I have to choose a di direction to make it um, have a kick in. So what I'm gonna do is give it a kick in the one direction and then that's my time zero. Okay, so omega one has a small kick, omega two stays zero, and then I let the system propagate as a function of time. 
Okay, so you can do this. You'll get um, your equation here. You know Euler's relation. You can convert e e e to the i theta to cos theta uh, mi minus i sine theta, and so you can decompose this into an omega now that looks a little bit like this: omega naught cos omega b t uh, minus omega naught sine omega b t and omega 3 on the end, okay? And if you want to take this one step further, you can then use um, the angular momentum being lambda 1, omega 1, lambda 2, omega 2, uh, lambda 3, omega 3 to give you um, lambda 1, omega naught, cos omega b, t, um, minus lambda 1 omega naught sine omega b t and uh, lambda 3 omega 3. Okay, that's our final situation there. And so we end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Um, we have an angular momentum that's got um, a term in this um, base rotation that you have in the start. Okay. And then you've got an additional two terms in the one and two directions. And not only are they an oscillation, but they're an oscillation that has a phase relationship. Okay, And so when one wobbles, the other one wobbles in phase such that you basically get like a spiraling motion. Let me go to my lemon juice bottles, that's clearer. So it'll be traveling along. And so it's going to be wobbling a little bit like this. Okay, And so if you look really carefully um, in some uh, American football matches when the throw isn't so good, sometimes you'll actually see this. There's like a, a wobble that's happening of the ball around its motion because it's been thrown in such a way that there's been a little kick at the start that's kind of knocked it off and it will just fly along like that, right? Um, everyone can go off tonight and go and look up their favourite uh, NFL um, videos and, and, and see that in action. Okay, so the interesting thing in, the, in all this is we've got a motion that looks a lot like precession because in the last lecture you notice we had a top and we'll come back to it in the second half. We had a top and it was basically doing a circular motion about an axis as well and what we had was an angular momentum, uh, angular velocity vector and a principal axis that all sat in one plane and then rotated, um, had a rotational motion, right? And we've got the same thing here. We've got um, very high speed rotation and now we've got that sort of same processional motion, but there's no torque, right? Um, there's no torque for two reasons. One, at the start of the problem we set the torque to be equal to zero. The other is that if we look at the um, terms that are in that processional motion, and in particular we look at um, omega b, you'll notice that there's no force terms in it whatsoever. There's two. There's a set of geometrical terms, a lambda one, lambda or lambda two, and lambda three, and an omega three, which is just a rotational um, velocity, right? This thing's a constant, and so the only way that this can really come about is if lambda one is not equal to lambda three, which is lambda two is not equal to lambda three. In other words, you've got an axial symmetry and not a spherical symmetry, and so what you've got here is a precessional effect that basically comes about not because of an external force, but comes about because of a broken symmetry in the system. Right? We've gone from spherical symmetry to axial symmetry, and that's driving a precessional motion. And that's a motion that we tend to call free precession. You'll see it if you um, spend ages trying to learn how to become good at throwing um, a, a football. You'll go through plenty of um, bad throws where you get free precession. The other place where you see it is um, in astronomy, there's an effect called Chandler wobble, which is basically the same thing happening with the Earth because the Earth doesn't have perfect spherical symmetry. Okay. I think this is a really good place to stop for this first half of the lecture on free precession. And so what I'm going to do in the second half is step it up even more. We're going to deal with um, a slightly more advanced concept called Euler angles. And then we're going to come back to precession again and get out uh, even more complex behavior that we call nutation. Um, I'll see you after the break.